so let's dig in. Uh, I don't think anybody on the call would disagree that engaging families in our students' education um, is, is something that we can just negate, right? It's, it's important. It's, it's a crucial part of us as educators. It's a crucial part of our students as learners. Um, and it's a crucial part of our school as a, a sort of a hub in our communities um, or of our child care centers in our communities um, and, and things like that. So one thing though that I wanted to discuss and sort of lay out there was this idea between family involvement versus family engagement. I've heard the terms used sort of interchangeably, um, but they're different. Uh, they're very different, to be honest. And so I wanted to take a minute and chat and sort of compare the two. So I, I would argue, and in my experience interacting with uh, folks in the field in Maine, the term and the practice of family involvement is the most common strategy. Um, and, and even as a parent, I would argue that this is um, the most most common way that my children's school interact with me. Um, and then we'll chat about ways that we could boost it to sort of meet this term of family engagement. And I wanted to add to that, there's a place for both of these, okay, in our education. It's not that I'm saying, don't do this, do that. I'm saying, great, we do this. What about boosting it and doing this um, as, as an add-on or an addition to. So I don't want this to, to, for anybody to think that I'm saying this is bad, it's not, this is great. Um, my point being that uh, you sort of stretch your thinking into other ways. So when we talk about family involvement, we sort of imply it as doing to, okay? So you're involving families by doing something to them. Think of it as um, maybe telling parents or asking parents how they can contribute. So you might have a project in your classroom that you send a note home to families and let, making them aware of the project. You know, we're going to be building um, a, a pond in our fish tank and we need dirt and sand and maybe some polywogs or maybe some um, small pond life animals or plants, okay? So there might be something happening in your classroom or in your school that you're telling parents about. Another way that we involve families or do something to them is by telling them what we need, right? We need extra glue sticks, we need some pencils, or we're having um, a show and tell and we need volunteers to come in and help you know, transition students um, between classrooms, or we're having some type of presentation, or um, volunteers are always welcome in my classroom. I have an open door policy, right? This is something that we're asking parents to do. Another form of involvement is through goals, either a school goal or a student specific goal. Um, so an example might be during parent conferences, right? you sit down with a parent and you're um, letting them know about your experience with their child in your classroom. And you might say, you know, my goal for Nicole in the next quarter is to, mm, you know, be writing sentences of, with three or four more words or something. Um, so letting parents know where you're at in, in the classroom as their child's educator. So in this scenario of family involvement, families feel like helpers. They follow the teacher's directions and suggestions, okay? Stepping a little deeper into this involving families role as educators, we're gonna talk about family engagement. So think of engagement as implying doing with the family. So you're collaborating with them, you're relating to the family of each child. So this might be easier to imagine as a classroom teacher um, in a smaller setting with students. If you're a principal or an administrator overseeing a school-wide population of young students, then this is doable, but it's probably going to take some more interacting with your teachers and with your staff to do it really well. So when you're collaborating with your families and relating to the family of each child, all of these other little pearls are going to come up into play. It takes a reciprocal relationship, okay? So you're interacting with the family and the family is interacting back. 
right? You're not just sending home a list with needs for the classroom. You're talking and engaging with the families and they're talking and engaging back. Okay, so you start to form this positive relationship of this give and take, this back and forth, um, and you're starting to build that trust with the family. Involve, or excuse me, engaging families is includes also decision making and goal setting. So different than just a student specific goal, now you're involving, or in, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do that a lot tonight. Now you're engaging the whole family in goal setting, not just the student. So you're not just saying, you know, I'm Mrs. Medor, your child's teacher. My goal with Nicole is for her to be writing four word sentences by the end of the quarter. Now you're saying, this is what I'm noticing in the classroom when Nicole writes. What do you see at home when Nicole writes? Tell me what you think where you want Nicole to be in her writing skills. How can I help you meet that goal of your child? Okay, so now that parent is an equal partner in the decision making and goal setting for their child. This leads into two way communication. So making sure that families, and it's going to vary because. The familiarity, the comfort, how comfortable people are communicating with your school varies. But that two-way communication needs to be open and obvious and welcomed um, all the time, right? So if a parent calls in the middle of the day, they need to know that their concern or their question or their need is going to be met and heard by whomever it is they're calling. Family engagement extends past the school walls into the home and into the community. It participates in advocacy efforts. So now we're getting even a little deeper and deeper. So I, it's not my expectation that these bullets are going to be um, successed with by this week, right? So this is going to take time. But digging deeper into some advocacy efforts. So is there some things that are coming across your state legislature that involve public school education, that involve child care, um, care and education, that involve early childhood and children within that system? Are there ways that your families could engage themselves in those efforts to better the education and care for their children in their communities? Okay, so having um, sort of an understanding of that and, and who to reach out to in terms of your families that would be willing to take on things like that. Um, engagement is also a comprehensive program level system and inclusion, not just inclusion of all students. We know that and we're going to continue to talk and practice that, but inclusion of all families. Okay, this gets back to my um, statement a moment ago where the comfort on the behalf of the family and engaging themselves with their child's education is going to vary greatly. But that doesn't mean we can stop and say, oh, you know, that family um, isn't as engaged with their child's education as this family, right? It just means that you're going to continue to include and continue your efforts with, the, with family A to get them um, more comfortable and more in tune with whatever engagement strategies work for them. So in this scenario of family engagement, families are equal partners in their child's education. So here's a, some other things to consider and to sort of um, compare your personal experiences and your experiences as an educator as well. So there's, we've fallen into some habits um, that we've become really accustomed to. Again, not that they're good or bad. They're just something to make mention of. So some of these familiar habits that we often do in public school around family engagement and family involvement strategies is that they're optional. So we might say, you know, we're having a math night, right? So bring, come bring your student, bring um, a loved one, a grandparent, whatever the case may be, and enjoy some, interact some fun interactive math activities. Um, this is an optional school-sponsored event, okay? So not everybody has to attend. It's sometimes events-based, again, in that same experience. We're going to come to the school, we're going to talk about math and play some math games, maybe have some resources, learn some strategies, etc. School-centered. Math night is Monday night at the school, okay? Or literacy night is Friday, or come make your own Sundays on Thursday at the school, at the school, at the school. Sometimes it's compliance based. So, um, for example, public PKs are asked to have at least two parent conferences a year with families to offer to 
parent conferences a year. And that's sort of a compliance piece because it's something that's written into rule. Rule chapter 124 says that. So schools do it because they feel like they have to do it to be in compliance with the law or with the rule or, or someone's some higher up expectation. It can often be intermittent, meaning there's no rhyme or reason to when something's going to happen. Somebody has a good idea, we plan it, we implement it, and that's that, versus having something that's regularly scheduled. A lot of times family involvement strategies are based around headcounts. So again, let's have a math night and see how many families we can get to come. See how many people in kindergarten come, how many people in first grade come, how many um, parents, how many grandparents, how many, um, you know, whatever the case may be, how many students come. The other um, habit familiar to this is that it's for some. So we know that some families really enjoy math night. Some families really enjoy a literacy night, but not all, right? I, I don't know if I've ever talked to a school that has hosted an event like that and has had 100% participation from all students and all families. Building off of those and talking about the possibilities that could be had by family engagement is instead of making them optional, let's move to a central. Okay, we can't educate your child without your engagement, without your communication, without your input. So instead of having something be based around an event, let's have it be sustained. So this is how we're going to engage our families all year long. We're going to have parent night, maybe, or um, we're going to have... Um, you know, a, a pickup game of kickball every Friday night and when it's springtime. Um, something that's sustained and ongoing and centered around the family. So in order to make it family centered, you will have likely needed to um, maybe surveyed or interacted with families to find out what their likes and interests and needs are. So if they like to get outside and do things outside, then you're probably going to want to offer some type of engagement that's outside. Um, if they like to gather around food and eat as a family every night, then you might want to offer something that involves that type of a setup. Uh, if they like to um, meet at the park and the gazebo where the family can talk and the children can play on the equipment, then you might want to plan something for the park. Okay? It doesn't have to be school-centered. It can be family-centered and based on their interests. Um, rather than it being a, a, something for compliance issues, you might have it be goal directed. So you might have a class classroom wide or a school wide goal. Um, maybe it has to do with student outcomes um, and bringing up test scores, which is not my favorite example. Um, maybe it has to do with um, your school's social emotional um, curriculum that's looking to include more students and get students interacting with new students and new families. But you might have something that you're looking to, to purposely meet. Rather than it being intermittent, it's going to be systemic, ongoing, regular, happens, families can expect it to happen without um, it being a random calendar event. It's going to have a specific student impact. So again, rather than worrying about how many people come, you want to know how that engagement strategy affected a student, affected a family. Okay, it had a, it was had a goal, and how did it work? And instead of it being for some, it's going to be for all. So one particular strategy you might find is attended by some, not all, but you're going to keep putting out strategies to get more involvement, to, excuse me, to get more engagement. Okay, so instead of saying, oh, we did good, we had 25% of our pre-K classroom represented, say, oh, that was good, but we missed 75%. What are we going to do next time to make sure, or what can we do to include the other um, missing families that weren't engaged in this particular activity? So some quick reasons on why we should focus on family engagement. Families we know benefit while the benefit while learning more about child development in general, and it's specific as it's applied to their children. So we've all heard and agree with the statement that families are experts on their children's development. And while I agree with that, I would also argue that early childhood educators have an expertise on their, that child's development as well. 
So by engaging families in different events, by engaging them in different communication strategies, by engaging them in building trust and reciprocal relationships, we're also educating them on child development in general, right? And so it, it should and often is specific to their own child's development. So for in Ina's example, right, if you have a student that um, seems to be having difficulty breaking away from screen time, and you've noticed that as their educator, you as an expert early childhood educator know that too much screen time is not a good thing for a multitude of reasons. The family knows that the child is on the screen and is having a hard time disengaging, but they might not have the information that you have around why too much screen time is too much. Too much of a good thing is too much, right? They might not know how to communicate with their child to disengage them from the screen. They might not know how to monitor screen time, right? There's apps that are available for families that they can keep track of, of, of their child's um, screen time and, and make uh, add parental controls and things like that. So there's two expertise, two experts in overseeing the education of this child. Both are equally important to engage in. Engagement in the preschool years specifically contributes to the success of children over time. Children and families with low income experiences, or excuse me, I'm going too fast. Children and families with low incomes experience added benefits from their early childhood educator, education when their families are engaged with their child care or with their school. Programs with effective family engagement respond best to the individual needs of diverse families. So again, when you have a student in your classroom or in your care, and you know that their family um, is struggling with one way with something, right? Maybe a, a mom recently lost her job, okay? So you can respond to that mom by saying and sympathizing with that and saying, you know, what can I do to help you? Or perhaps you could say, you know, our school's hiring for, um, ed techs, for teachers, for bus drivers, whatever the case may be, and effectively responding to that individual's need. Students experience improved social, emotional, and behavioral development when they know their families are engaged, when they know their families um, or their parents know what's going on day to day in school, when moms and dads and grandmoms and foster moms know what is being taught, they can have a better idea of how to carry over that conversation at home. Strong family engagement efforts can support improved transitions among grades and in, into school. And we know that intensive supports such as home visiting and parent group membership have the strongest impact on child outcomes. And that speaks back to um, all of these bullets, to be honest, but specifically the purple one around the con contributing to the success of children, as well as the green one and improved social, emotional, and behavioral development. So I want to share a, a quick video. Um, this video is going to talk about, you can see here, effective family engagement. And we're gonna refer back to it in another activity in a little bit. Um, so I wanna make sure that everybody can hear this. As we work to help every child succeed and to close gaps in student achievement, we often assume school is the main place the learning is going to happen. Take Esma. It used to seem to her family and her educators that Esma is always at school. Not true, it turns out. Esma and other students actually spend 82% of their waking hours at home or in their community. All those weekends, weeknights, and breaks add up. When they realized that, the educators in Esma's school district decided to work harder on making the most of the biggest partner in her learning life, her family. This can look different in every school, but for Esma's teacher, it means instead of spending his time arranging a traditional open house, he organizes grade level parent meetings. Here, Esma's family saw data on how the class is doing in math, reading, social and emotional learning. They practiced new ways to help Esma at home and set goals for how they'll help her improve. Everyone learned from each other as the group talked about how to help the students. Also, near the start of the school year, some staff from Esma School visited her home. They looked for the assets her family members can bring to the educational process. 
They learned about their languages, their culture, their lives, their world. Grandpa offered to be a resource for other English learner families. And the school also listened and learned from the family's perspective on Esma's needs. They learned how mom helps her calm down and focus. This kind of family engagement also makes it easier for the district to develop individualized education programs for students, including those in special education. The foundation is already there for families to engage in their students' academic and career planning too, making that more effective. Throughout the year, the family can attend workshops at the school on things like mental health, homework, or career exploration. Esma's mom saw those meetings on a poster in her work break room, and now she's inviting other parent friends to go with her. Esma's school district works with local businesses, places of worship, the public library, and other partners to reach students and families where they're already spending time. The school provides information frequently in a variety of ways so they can reach every family. Text messages are offered in the most common languages of local families. Esma's family gets photos from her teachers so they know what she's doing during the day. Communication between the school and the family is a group effort focused on helping Esma achieve her learning goals. When Esma wasn't sure what to do on a science assignment, her family knew to contact the teacher for a little clarification. Educators take a positive approach as they look for solutions to any challenges experienced on either side. They're always looking for the family's strengths. Also, when mom mentions that Esma has trouble making friends, the teacher knows to refer her to the school counselor. The counselor then helps the family join a local boys and girls club with lots of activities for Esma. The teacher knew to do this because the school counselor led staff trainings on resources available in the community and how to help families access them. There's no danger of a family like Esma's ever feeling like an occasional onlooker. The school knows what families have to offer and the family knows what's going on in the classroom and how to support it. They feel they're active and regular collaborators and decision makers. The district gives families opportunities to learn how to help children succeed at each level of the school system and to serve on school groups. At school gatherings, Esma's adult stepsister and close next door neighbor also feel included in the community. Staff at the school are trained to be as inclusive as possible, welcoming as learning partners anyone who cares about the child. Esma's school has moved from parent involvement to family engagement. Not surprisingly, engaged families help students learn better. Staff members like their jobs better. Everyone wins. This is backed up by over 40 years of research. Students with engaged families, no matter their income, background, or culture, are more likely to do well in school, enroll in ambitious courses, graduate, and go on to post-secondary education. They also have stronger social skills and fewer disciplinary issues. So how do we make it happen? First, we work to make the shift across an entire school district. Sure, at the elementary level, Esma's classroom teacher is the main person her family interacts with at school. But as she gets older and her schooling more complex, collaboration is definitely bigger than one person. Really, all along the way, the family's interactions with pretty much everyone in connection with the school from office staff to after school staff, from bus drivers to principals, will need to be positive for them to truly feel welcomed. So it's a clear expectation in the district. Every employee has a role in helping every family feel connected to their child's learning, no matter what building or classroom that child attends. In Esma's district, a broad team that included school psychologists, social workers, counselors, families, general and special educators, and after school program staff, helped everyone in the school take family engagement to this next level in a way that works for their community. It worked. Esma's family feels like a valued member of the team. Esma, her family, and her educators feel confident that she's learning and happy at school. We have more information about how schools and families can effectively engage with each other around students' learning on our website. Okay, so now we're gonna use an MTSS framework so we're familiar briefly with the tiers of um, systems of support, right? So we're gonna use that sort of visual model to assess and improve our family engagement efforts. So we've talked before that the, the foundational level, right, is the tier one. And you might recall from last week that some districts even add a foundational level prior to this tier one. Um, but for today's conversation, we're going to start here. 
So this is the universal tier, right? This is the school-wide support system for all families. So the tier one establishes the school culture. It communicates expectations for behavior and learning. And an effective universal support should meet the needs of most families. So they're provided for all families, right? But all families might not necessarily benefit from it, but most will. So when we're thinking of an example, perhaps, of a family engagement practice, we might talk about, um, let's say, open house, right? So it's the beginning of the school year. You have incoming pre-K students or incoming kindergarten students. And keep in mind, these students and perhaps some of their families have never been in your school before, right? This might be that family's oldest child. So this is their first experience with your setting, okay? So what might be an engagement effort that you provide for all families? And I may have just sort of answered that in my example, but just curious to hear from, from anyone out there. What might be a way to get all families engaged in your open house night? Food and child care, good answer. Okay, so I'll run uh, a phone call to families for right? Right, so, so before you even establish the open house night, right, you've got to make sure that families know that it exists. <laughs> so you've got to get out some type of communication to the families of incoming students that they're welcome to join you on Monday night at five o'clock for open house night. Okay, so your first tier one example here is going to likely be some type of communication to all families. So Christina mentioned perhaps a phone call to all families. So that's a great strategy. Certainly if you have um, a manageable number of students and families to call, that's a great way to do it. Um, if you're talking about a school-wide open house and, and multiple classrooms of multiple children, then phone calls might be a little extensive, so excessive, I mean. So you may consider, um, you know, an email or a newsletter or something. Jessica, I'll be interested in hearing about your different approach, so hold that thought. Or, yeah, a postcard or some type of a personal invite, good idea. Have the kids prepare something? Okay, that's a great idea too. Okay, so and then Jessica, you mentioned a, a smaller, more personalized experience. So hold that thought too. Okay, so we've sort of established and we'll just run with the idea that in a tier one effort for family engagement at open house night, we've got to make them all aware. And we're gonna communicate that perhaps through a newsletter, a phone call, a postcard home, something to that effect. Okay, so that's offered to all families, fantastic. The next tier that we're going to talk about is the responsive one. So here we're going to take what we did in tier one, right, our communication strategies, and you've realized that you haven't reached or, or there's potential that you have not reached all families, right? Even though you sent home the newsletter, the postcard, sent the email, it doesn't mean that all families received it and read it and sort of internalized it, right? So in a tier two, we're going to talk about a support that supports that are programs and strategies, specifically strategies here, for groups of families who need additional support. So families receive targeted supports based on their needs that are more intense and more frequent. So in this one, we're gonna take everything we did in tier one and layer on an additional support strategy that's going to address the needs of um, perhaps a smaller group of families. So we've communicated with them. We found out that some, didn't, some families did not access that communication. So now what are you gonna do next? What's a tier two support or strategy that you could provide for some family who need it in response to them? Okay, maybe additional emails or phone calls. Oh, Elaine. 
Okay, offer an alternative date or a Zoom type of meeting. Okay, so that's exactly sort of where my mind was going to. It's not a right or wrong answer in any of these, but just as for argument's sake, that's where I was going. So you've offered communication for open house tonight on Monday in tier one. The trouble is, is that you have three families in your classroom whose family and parents work evenings. They can't attend your open house night. So in an, a family involvement mindset, then that might be, oh, that's okay, you know, no big deal, or we'll get you in, or I'm sure your child will transition just fine. But in family engagement effort, we that's not gonna be okay for us, right? Nope, I, I want to engage with you. I want you to come and see this space, or I want your child to feel comfortable on the first day of school. How else might I support you and your family in providing an open house night experience. So to Elaine's point, you might offer another day. Okay, I understand Monday doesn't work for you. Is there another evening this week where I could meet you at school and provide you all the resources and information that open house night does? Okay, that's a great idea. So of the three families that we provided support for in tier two here, there's one family that you're still unable to reach. So there's one family that you still get to provide another layer of support for to engage them in your open house night experience, all right? So this is gonna be your tier three support. This is gonna be your more intense focus on a specific family's needs. So that family received the communication. You offered an alternate night, but they're still not able to commit to that. So now we've got to talk about a, a more intense strategy to engage that family in your open house night or your open house night um, goals. So what might be an, a more intense strategy for that one family? Perfect. So I see two examples coming through. three examples actually, excuse me, all which are fantastic ideas. So it could very well be that that particular family is very uncomfortable in a large social situation, right? We don't know. It's not for us to assume one way or the other, but it, it may be necessary to say, would you feel more comfortable coming on an evening that's just me and you, right? Where no other families are present. It may be in Jacqueline's example, that that family really wants to be involved and wants to come on Monday night. However, doesn't have the transportation to get there. So is there something that you could provide for them? Could you could a school bus go and pick up um, families that sign up for rides who, are, who feel more comfortable and need that service? You know, is there somebody in the community that could offer them a ride? Is there a taxi service, an Uber service? You know, whatever the case may be. In Anna's example, a ride, similarly, or a home visit. So perhaps that family is not comfortable in a social situation or physically can't get to the school to experience your open house night goals. So now we're providing that in the home to them, right? You can offer coming to them and, and visiting them and, and providing the resources, providing pictures. Maybe you record um, a tour of your classroom that you can share with them in their home with their child to provide that. Um, an asynchronous event is not missing the mark. No, uh, recording something similar to what I was just saying to Jacqueline, right? Recording something and providing it at a later date might meet the needs of that family. Right, so the, the, the goal here is extending your relationship request, your, uh, for lack of a better word, right? And just starting off in the beginning of the school year for in our open house night example as a way of engaging families right from the get-go. And there are ways, to Christina's point here in the chat, about finding out the barriers for the families 
and so soon in the school year, it might be tricky to do that because your reciprocal relationship with that family might not be solid yet, right? It's just starting. But certainly as the school year progresses and that relationship and that two-way communication continues to grow, that trust will hopefully continue to grow. And those barriers for the family in engaging are going to become more um, more prominent and you'll be able to address them even more intensively as, as needed. How did that feel for folks, sort of running it? We're gonna do it again, um, but before I do that, how did that feel to sort of run it through these quick filters? Any confusion or, or um, thoughts? Seems a little helpful. So moving forward, maybe, just like we would have a student moving through these layered levels of support, the reasons for a student to change levels, are the reasons for a student to go from tier one needing a tier two, or perhaps being in a tier three and then make, seeing improvements and bumping down to a tier two, that same movement and sort of fluidity is going to be present for our engagement practices with families. So I just wanted to take a second and talk about what things we might see that would indicate a need for this. So in our last example, we realized that our open house night on Monday night um, wasn't accommodating for all families schedules, right? So we realized that some families needed a tier two support, right? They needed an alternate night perhaps for them to come and join us. Um, and then even then for some families that still wasn't enough support. So we had to potentially do a home visit, maybe provide transportation, maybe provide something asynchronously, you know, and be created that way. So what other changes might indicate a need for family engagement strategies to sort of um, fluctuate between these. So there's some examples here. I'm actually going to start presenting this for a second. And type in some as we think of them as well. So a change within the school might indicate a need to increase or lower layers for support. A change within the family. Uh, within the student or within the community. And, and we talked to, and the other day too that those changes within the family or the student um, could be significant. Um, they could be negative. You, they could be positive. So if you think of a family um, in, who regularly engages with you in a tier one strategy, so all communication you send home, they're communicative about. Anytime you call and discuss something with them, they're, they're there and engaging with you. But then you realize that that family has experienced perhaps a significant change like a death in the family, right? And so now you're realizing that they're not as communicative anymore, right? That death in the family, that change that they've experienced in their life, has had a negative impact on their engagement with you. So now that family may require a, a um, more responsive support in tier two. On the flip side of that, you could be working or on engaging with a family who's, in my example earlier, families work nights, right? They work overnight. So they're often not communicative with you because the time of day that you're available to meet with them when you're outside of the classroom is not a good time for them. So you're regularly providing that family with tier three support to meet the needs of their schedule. However, it comes to be that that family has a significant change in that they no longer work nights. Now they work days. So they can be more communicative and engaged in with just tier one. So that family is now bumped from a tier three, perhaps down to a tier two, perhaps straight down to a tier one. So a significant change in the school, the family, um, or the student can certainly indicate a need to move, move your strategies and supports. Um, when your current practices are not a good fit, we talked about that a, a little bit, a need for a change in intensity or dose versus a change of practice. Um, and I'm curious if there are others that I'm not thinking of here that we can add to this list. Feel free to chime in.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these examples that folks are popping up with um, are significant changes like that we talked about um, with the student, the school, or the family, right? Um, perhaps uh, parents' um, engagement is affected um, after a foster care placement or a divorce, separation, um, trauma, sickness, certainly, or a birth, exactly. So I know it's really easy for our minds, and this is totally understandable, to go down the road of these examples of, of trauma, of negative experiences. Um, but let's not forget that even positive experience, you know, it's not always about starting at tier one families and moving up. Once we're accustomed to this practice, it's like I said, it's possible that somebody's regularly receiving supports in a tier two or tier three, and then something changes that they no longer need that level of support. And so now they're back down at, at a level one, perhaps, right, which would be a positive change, potentially. So you bring up an interesting point in the chat box, Janet, around, again, this year and having had some kids who are listed as remote learners and that their families have been very difficult to locate or communicate with. So keeping that in mind, and you don't have to answer this now, I'm just throwing this out to the group, keeping that in mind moving forward, you know, what was it about our remote learning structure that made it difficult for some families to reach or that made it difficult for some families to for us to communicate with them or for them to communicate with us and thinking of that and and maybe running it through this practice maybe just giving it some um you know thought with other families you know to, to improve on that right so certainly hopefully some families of students who were learning remote had a positive experience with that you know and gaining that information from them, engaging in those conversations with them, what worked well, why was this successful for you, and learning from that. You know, was there something that you did for that family that you could provide for another family? Perhaps it was Wi-Fi access. Perhaps it was the time of day that you were asking students to log in if it was a synchronous learning. Um, you know, I don't I don't know, but it's certainly um, something to take of note and, and work forward with. So this next piece here is around the roles that families can play and can take on in our family engagement strategy. So as I go through these, there's, I believe, oh, five or six or so, one, two, three, there's five. So I sort of challenge you to think of a family that you've worked with recently or perhaps in the past who would take, you can envision taking on this role. Okay, um, and that'll make more sense in a minute. So I'll go through one at a time. So one role that families can play is that of the initiators. So this is where families are saying, they're speaking out and saying, we need this support. Okay, so think of an initiator in terms of a family, um, the parent who calls and says, um, I need help with my students. Um, math assignment, right? They don't do math the way I used to do it and I need help, right? Or the parent saying, we were hoping to attend the math night, but something's come up and I no longer have transportation. Can you support me in getting transportation? Or um, I know that there was a bus run. I didn't sign up for it. Could you add me to the list, right? So think of family, and you don't have to say it out loud or in the chat or anything like that. This is just for your own personal practice. Think of a family that you can envision in the past who could fill this role of an initiator. While you're thinking of that, I'll just move us ahead to the next one. So another role that we often see in family engagement practices are families playing that of the co-designers. Okay, so in this scenario, in this example, the parents, the families are part of the team that are making decisions, right? So they're saying, what are those appropriate supports and services for families? Our families are at the table. Um, so like Nina's example earlier in hosting an uh, event in the evening for families and taking attendance and then looking at your attendance later and wondering how to improve on that, inviting families to that table, inviting families to that conversation to help you co-design the next 
family event that you want to host, right? Getting their feedback and offering um, them offering their thoughts on what could have been better or what we need to consider next time. So just take a second and, and see if you can imagine um, or think of a family you've worked with in the past who might fit the role of a co-designer. So if you haven't done that before, who you might invite to the table as a co-designer. So again, this isn't just sending home a letter to say we need glue sticks. This is sending home or, uh, or sending out a request for parents to join you in an ongoing conversation about something. The fifth, or excuse me, the third of five roles that a family might play are those uh, that are receivers of support. So we're the staff of the school. We're helping to meet their basic needs and to learn appropriate interactions and assistance strategies, et cetera. So these are the families um, who potentially are receiving our tier two or our tier three supports, right? We're providing transportation. We're providing alternate evenings um, to accommodate their schedule. Um, we're giving, sending home resources, sending home videos um, to help support them in interacting with their child in a more proactive way, something like that. Okay, so you're engaging these families because they need our support. Go ahead and try and envision that family for you. Another way that families can take on a role in this is being providers of support. So now they they assist us with that school to home carryover. So in the video we watched, Esma's grandfather, I believe, offered to provide support and resources for families in the school that don't speak English, right, if I remember correctly. In this scenario, another example might be um, when you've engaged a family around a recent or an upcoming unit of study that you're going to be doing with your students and asking them um, to carry that over at home, right? So maybe you want to create um, a pond in your classroom and, and a fish tank right? and asking families if they can provide any expertise or provide support um, for you in home. Another example might be you know, you're working with a group of students on improving their reading skills. And so you send home strategies, you send home books, you engage their families to, to continue that practice at home. Okay. I'm sure you can all um, envision families that you've worked with who help you help to provide the support in the home. And the fifth role that families can take on are those of evaluators. So in this scenario, families provide feedback, what's working. So again, your school is looking to improve your playground. So you host a parent night, you engage families to come in person. Perhaps you set up um, a virtual live stream for those who can't come in person but want to have a voice in, in providing feedback. Um, maybe you send home a survey and ask families for feedback. So there's multiple ways to collect information from families in a way that they're evaluating what's working, right? That slide on the playground is 30 feet high and made of metal, right? Time to, time to update it. Um, so getting that from them, not just assuming that you know what's right for their students on a playground, but asking them to provide feedback as well. And I guess I would ask too, can you sort of see the difference, start to see the difference here between family involvement and the roles which families could play in family engagement, right? And I'm willing to bet that if you were able to envision the families that you've had experience working with, no two families fit this, right? Like the Medor family were initiators, but the Fish family were co-designers, but this family was receivers of support. They all fell into different pieces. They all played different roles, right? That's a good thing. So with that in mind, we're going to run through another whole group scenario. So this time, the way this will work is I'm going to ask a, a provide a scenario and sort of ask the question. And if you have a response, I'm not going to ask anybody to unmute themselves during this one. It's going to be strictly done through the chat room. So once I ask a question, I'm just going to ask you to type your response in the chat box, but don't send it yet. Okay, just have it prepared but don't send it until I say send. 
and then all of your our responses and thoughts will come scrolling in like a waterfall at once, okay? So our next conversation here, we're gonna keep everything that we've just discussed in mind, especially our recent current uh, presentation here around the roles of which families can play. So keep all of that at the forefront of your mind, and we're gonna talk about a scenario that I think many of us can relate to, which is new student screening. Okay, so anytime that a public setting has um, pre-K students coming in or kindergarten students coming in, um, it's part of our main state law that we provide a developmental screening on those students, right? Sort of get some, some type of baseline data on where that student is individually in their development and if we need to potentially um, add additional services that they can um, grow and develop at, at a pace that mirrors that of our typically developing students, right? So our scenario is, is we work at a school, we have incoming students getting ready to join our setting, and we need to set up the new student screening. So in our tier one strategy for our family engagement around this scenario, we need to think about what all families need. So get your chat box open if you can. Think of what all families will need, all the families of those students coming in, what do they need for a new student screening? Just type your answer, but don't send it quite yet. I'll give us just a few more seconds and I'll add to this as well. Another five seconds. Okay, if you're ready, go ahead and hit enter and let your answers pour through. Okay, bear with me, I'm just gonna scroll through them. Okay, lots of similar responses here, which is great. Okay, so the, the most common answer and response I saw here was information about the screening, right? So families, we need to know um, when you're screen, you hope to screen their child. They need to know why you're going to screen your child and perhaps even how you're going to screen their child, right? So having all of that information ready to go for families, okay? So quick, uh, just quickly, how in a tier one strategy support here, how would you get that information to parents? Go ahead and type your answer in the chat. Okay, you can send that answer in whenever you're ready now. I'm seeing letters home, phone calls, email, mail, other technology. I had mentioned a Facebook post. I know that's a common um, communication tool now. The school web page, social media, exactly. Okay, so all of those examples are all perfect ones to utilize in a tier one support to make families aware of new student screening, right? It's not a, a one answer, right? It's not only providing an email, right? Certainly all of those fit because all of those are being sent to all the families that you know are coming in um, or families of incoming students, okay? So typically when we set up new student screening, we have a sign up, okay? So for this scenario, we're asking families to sign up on one of the days that it's offered. So let's say you're expecting six, you've sent information home to 16 students, the families of them, okay? And your screening date is either a Monday or a Thursday, okay? So 16 families have received information to sign up for screening on this Monday, or this Thursday. Okay, great, perfect, common. The trouble now is that this Monday is coming up. 
and you have open slots. Okay, so of all the 16 students, families who you reached out to, only 10 have signed up and solidified their slots for screening. So whatever tool you use to communicate with all your families around sign up, date, when, why, how, didn't reach all families for one reason or another. Okay, so now we know that six additional families, not additional, six of those 16, six families now need a more responsive approach. Okay, so some of them were sent the communication, but now need something else. Okay, so be thinking and type in the chat box, but don't send it yet. Be thinking about what that something else for those six families might be. Five more seconds. Oh, go ahead and send, sorry. <laughs> I sent mine a different stuff. Okay. So now we're talking about a phone call to families, asking what they need. Mrs. Deacon and I were on the same page, asking what they need in order to attend or what you can do to help them attend, right? In a phone call. So Elaine mentioned possibly a language support, a translation, transportation, child care, et cetera. So this came up the other night too. And um, Andrea, I don't want to put you on the spot and I can um, explain this if you want to, but this, I, the strategy around language support, is that something you want to um, mention? Sure. Um, I think what you're referring to, Nicole, is the brief conversation we had on Monday about um, if you're working in a school where you have multiple languages or you have to represent your materials in multiple languages, um, being being just careful to understand that, you know, if you send out a letter to a family or to a group of families because everybody gets the letter, but you have to send out some of those letters in a completely different language, um, you might think that you're providing an additional layer of support for that family, right? Because you've changed in some way the, the format of the letter that everybody is getting. But what you're actually doing is differentiating. And so you haven't actually left that layer of support. So in this case, the tier one level, what you've done is you have differentiated that item to meet a, a need that a different type of family might have. And so it's important to remember that um, when you are layering support, that you don't actually take away one to get to the other, like you're actually adding the items on top of each other. And any modifications um, that you do or accommodations that you do within that layer is just that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an, a, an accommodation, not necessarily a support within a support, if that makes sense. Right, yes, thank you. And that's exactly what I was referring to. So in, in some of these examples for the tier two, um, you know, a lot of folks mentioned, and I would agree with that, a specific or a personal phone call home to those six families to verify their um, involvement or their attendance, I should say, at the new student screening is important. But even in that scenario, if you know that all of those families or one or two of those six families do not speak English in the home, then it's possible that you may need to offer translated support for that phone call, right? And that's not a necessarily additional support, it's just an accommodation you're making to engage those families. So to Andrea's point, we've provided, if you have a family who doesn't speak English in the home, we've provided them notification in their home language, it was already translated for them, because that's part of the universal support here that family happened to not sign up for a slot for screening. So now you're giving, providing them a phone call in their home language with translation as needed, right? So that, that translation piece is, um, is not necessarily a, a layered support, more of an accommodation that you'll provide regardless of what layer you're in. Does that make sense? 
So I'm glad that that came up um, because that's an important point to make. Just gonna scroll these real quick again. Okay, perfect. All right, so now our, our third layer here, our third tier that we're gonna talk about. So congratulations, you've now reached out to these six families and four of them were able to sign up for slots on that Monday or the Thursday of the days that you are offering new student screening. So your tier two supports for those, for four of those families were successful, fantastic. However, right, we still have two families who have not responded to sign up. And they weren't responsive in your tier two support of whether it was a phone call home or, or what have you. Now we have two families who appear to need an additional layer of support to get them engaged in attending their new student screening. So let's think of something, a more intensive strategy for those two families who appear to need highly individualized, um, who have highly individualized needs that you need to support. So take a moment to type it in the chat box. Five more seconds. When you're ready, you can flow it through. Okay, great. So these two families that are left without a screening date might require or benefit from a home visit. So having that as an option. These families might benefit from I'm scrolling the wrong way here. An alternate date, right? Maybe that Monday or Thursday doesn't work for them. So offering an alternative day or time to meet with them and their student, okay? Maybe practicing a virtual screening, right? That's something that we're sort of more open to nowadays for sure. Okay, right. So great, those were great responses. So now I want to just, uh, so congratulations, I should say. All 16 families have taken a slot and have now have dates and times for um, their new student screening. So I'm, I'm not going to run this next idea through a, a filter here, but I did just sort of want to engage through chat or unmuting yourself and ask this. So the new student screening day is here. Okay? It's Monday. Our incoming students that are on the list are starting to flow in. What are you gonna do? What could you do, right? Let's assume this is in-person screening, not COVID screening with all kinds of safety protocols in place. Let's think of this as um, what we would know as a typical screening appointment. What family engagement strategies could you employ on that day with those families that are coming in? Let's not worry right now about these layered supports. Just in general, what are some things you could do then and there with the families while their students are being screened to improve your engagement with them. Feel free to chatter and meet. Have sort of an open conversation. So there's a response in the chat box that you could spend some time getting to know them, the family, and their child. You might offer a school tour, okay? Offer childcare if they need it, right? If their um, student has a sibling that the family needs um, to have care for. Have an activity for them um, or a drawing to complete if they want, if they have to wait. Meet with the parents and go over logistics like drop off, pick up, some safety protocols. Um, offer any resources around parent training if they're interested. An organized flow of families so, know, so families know what they need to do, right? Coffee, right? Play area while students are waiting. Share about me, yeah. 
Um, oh, I see what you're saying there. Um, ask them to share more about themselves, I think is what you're getting at, Rebecca. But also I would add to that, share more about you, right? Like, so if you're gonna be the classroom teacher, um, you know, could you take two minutes and, and just chat with the family about yourself? It, during these times too, I really encourage um, administration to get out there and, and shake parents' hands, right? Look them in the eye and welcome them um, to your setting, introduce yourself, things like that. Um, I love the idea of providing, you know, coffee or refreshments, right? That's a great welcoming strategy. Um, it's sort of like that water cooler effect, right? So when you go to get water and say, hey, how are you doing? You know, um, beautiful weather we're having, right? Just having a natural human to human conversation with them, right? Starting to sort of feel them out. So one school that I know too, um, during their, it's not during their new student screening, it's actually during open house night. However, I would argue you could do it during any type of event like that. Um, they have other community um, folks join them. So for example, they have a representative from their little league come and they have a table set up with information about their little league sports that they provide um, and provide information for families and schedules or whatnot. They have somebody from the local pediatrician's office there offering supports around appointments and doctors and things like that. A local dentist comes and sets up and gives away toothbrushes and things to get families um, involved with their local dental office. Um, the local Hannaford might be there offering information and tips on, on nutrition and, and healthy ways to support your child's growth through food, um, things like that. So, so don't, don't feel like you're um, trapped within the walls of let's get the student in, let's get the student screen, let's get the family out, right? This is a really huge opportunity to engage families in what your school is all about, what your community is all about. Remember, a lot of families, this is their first interaction um, with you in, in this setting. So, um, oops, I keep kidding. Yeah, so I love that idea too, Mrs. Deacon, having older students there, right? So some schools do this during the school day towards the end of the school year. So it's very possible that first graders, second graders, fifth, sixth, whatever grade levels are present in your locate setting, um, it's very possible that teachers could spare a few of them to come down and interact with the students and, and um, they could even tour families around. You know, this is where we um, come in if you're on bus three every day and this is where we exit, this is our playground, et cetera. Um, right? That's a great way to, to engage the rest of your school community. The quick strategy to sort of assess if your family engagement plan is um, effective. Right, so this is something that we call the parade strategy. It's just a, a visual tool to kind of keep these running through your mind every time that you're um, engaging in a new family engagement strategy. So the first thing we want to make sure is, is the P, is it proactive and preventative? So is, is whatever engagement strategy you're about to put out into the universe proactive, right? Is it coming from a place of wanting to build relationships, coming from a place of encouraging communication, getting the family's voice, et cetera? The A is for all. So do all have an opportunity to access whatever strategy it is that you're putting out there, to access screening, to access open house, to access a parent meeting, um, to access an informational night, to access conferences, whatever the case may be. Um, the way we just went through the, that layering activity is a way to assure that all have an opportunity to be heard in that. We talked about the roles of families. So um, have you taken in consideration the initiators, the co-designers, the evaluators, et cetera? A, is, is it planned in advance or is it something that was rushed to get out the door before Friday school dismissal, right? Making sure that we're planning ahead. The D always is for data. So are the decisions and the things that you're um, putting out to the universe based on data within your school? Um, so, you know, you, you have families that um, regularly do not attend things in person. So using that data to drive what you do next to engage those families, right? Obviously, events in person isn't something that engages them. So what else might it be? 
and E is for evidence. So are the strategies that you're employing um, evidence informed? So will there be a result at the end of, of your practice? Okay, that's a lot of information. We're not experts on this yet. For many, this is really just sort of a um, mind stretching session, right? Of, of looking beyond family involvement um, and employing other strategies to really engage families on a different level. Um, so that was a lot of information to have and we ran through some really great um, scenarios, but I know that your schools experience things differently than the scenarios that I gave. So I wanted to be able to provide time for folks to work amongst yourselves and your like-minded communities to, to practice this. 